So, I am going through my hard drive and I find this old ass fucking video, a vlog that I did in a car when I once had a car. Yeah, the video is, uh, like two years old. Uh, so I decided that I'm gonna go ahead and post it and edit it. The editing took about, I don't know, two hours? It, it was like a 35 minute video, I got it down to 28. Uh, yeah, it's just me talking about shit. You know, I I was talking with KNR and, uh, KNR, <laughs> however you want to say it, I was talking with him and I, I told him that one of the sad things that come with reading as seldom as I do is that I find myself, uh, writing and dictating, uh, thoughts and notions that have already occurred to somebody, I don't know, like 200 years ago. Um, so, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, especially for this guy. And the reason why I don't read too much is because things have a tendency to stick even if it's ridiculous, stupid, trite stuff. And so I, I try to stay away from it. I mean, you're talking with the, you're talking to the guy, or you're listening to the guy, that's got a little fucking radio playing in his head all the time. You know, things have a tendency to stick in here and have their little effect on the way I live my life, and so I avoid reading as much as possible because of that. Which is really sad, because I honestly do love reading. Anyway, yeah, like, I don't know, I, I'm a high school dropout, GED, you know, like... I'm not the world's smartest guy. I know this. So, or at least not the world's most educated guy. I'm pretty smart, I think. Um, but yeah, so I, I made this video like two years ago. I'm going to go ahead and submit it for your uh, viewing ambivalence. So, uh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> uh, roll the music, or cue the music. Yes. <laughs> Everything we do is pretend, at least on any intellectual level. Anything that we do is pretend. I mean, without the intellect, without the mind, without the capacity to re reason and conceptualize, uh, man is just a baser, primitive beast that eats, kills, procreates, and dies. That's what life does. It's a self-replicating process that acts in accordance with its own design and that is simply to self-replicate. Rodents, mammals, aquatic life form, it all falls under that same, same line. It's multiply, eat, die. Multiply, eat, die. So therein is the truth. But man has got this capacity to do more. I think that a lot of life actually has a capacity to do a lot more than just that. We're endowed with other traits. A lot of that has to do with that self-replicating process, that design of ours that, that dictates that we multiply and die. But in that, concept comes about. And concept is that which, well, it kind of transcends the truth. It transcends the facts. It transcends the physical limitations of our material world, as it were. Empathy, for example. I like to take the objective standpoint that morality in and of itself is based off of fitness and our capacity to thrive and survive as a culture and as a species. You know, that our ability to survive, being that we are a species that is codependent upon one another, that empathy becomes a very, very necessary part of what it is that we are and what it is that we do. And in there you've got an objective groundwork or an objective framework for morality. And of course it also, I think, goes, goes on to show that there is a certain diversity in which we exude morality, or at least the way we, we uh, pin it down, you know, the way we exemplify morality, um, in that you've got different social social norms and traits that differ from each culture to culture to culture. Like what is regarded as theft is very different from one nation than what it is in another nation. Rights are the exact, function on the exact same level. 
but they're all forged and formed from this notion of empathy. And what is pretty universally agreed upon is that theft and murder um, are are wrong, one way or another. The definitions for theft and murder vary, but to steal and to murder are are criminal in almost every culture. I think it was Immanuel Kant who uh, who pointed that out, and I do think that uh, there is an objective groundwork for morality just based off of our human design, um, our evolved traits, and and our uh, acquired skills for survival. Like I say, we're codependent on, on one another. Um, there are plenty of species that are absolutely not codependent at all. As a matter of fact, there are um, a number of species that are completely and utterly singular. The moment, um, moment they're born, they're born alone. They thrive alone. They mate and they die. You know, their their self-replicating process works under different parameters, different acquired parameters, and you don't see a whole lot of morality in those in those creatures. You know, insects, um, ants though. Ants are extraordinarily codependent, and even with them, I'm sure that one could observe um, certain behaviors that would be uh, depict of certain very, very, very crude, simple basis of right and wrong. But varying species of spiders, however, they're cannibalistic. You don't really see vast amounts of generosity or, or charity go on in, in, in the insect kingdom. But with, with ants, it's a very different thing. They collect food for the whole, you know what I mean? So in there, you, you do kind of have this socialized notion of charity that it's it's a socialistic net, you know, to um, from each to their ability and to each according to their need type of situation. I know that's kind of silly, but I mean it's ants, right? But still, I mean it's it, it's like I say, uh, the way each species um, evolves and adapts to continue to procreate and to multiply, I think is is where morality, the, the, the objective root for morality can be found, actually. And, you know, our, our morality, human morality, is, is based off of fitness for the most part. The reason theft is, is damaging is because it damages the whole, you know. Um, the reason murder is damaging because it drops the fitness level. Anything that drops the fitness level will get criminalized. What I think is really interesting in those bounds when we start talking about more complex, I mean, greater than insects, more complex creatures, I read this story about um, a bear that escaped captivity. They were torturing the animals um, for, for uh, I guess, their bile or something like that. Anyway, it was, it's, if I can find the link, I'll find it, um, and I'll, I'll drop it down there. But apparently this, this mother bear had escaped captivity heard one of its own children crying out in fear because, you know, the people around it were just about ready to prep it for um, harvest and whatnot, and it grabbed its cub, smothered it to death, and then killed itself. That brings about a multitude of different questions, you know. Obviously, the bear escaped because it was in pain, right? That, that can pretty well be determined, but the the um the capturing of its own cub just to kill it would that same bear have acted the exact same way if it had been another bear's cub you know uh was it doing it simply to maim a bear and then kill itself it's just you know like the reasons and the motives as to why but I definitely do think one way or the other that it's illustrative of um, behaviors that supersedes what we have normally observed within the uh, kingdom. I, I would suggest that if you 
take a look further into it, you would you would definitely come to some conclusion of morality being illustrated or, or shown essentially. Um, morality, you know, being shown in, in a different species, a species other than human being. And so in that, I don't think that morality is just limited to, you know, us, the homo sapien. I don't think it's just limited to just us. And that species um, that have a, a higher level or an increasing level of codependency um, will um, illustrate varying forms of, of morality. Um, but what does this all have to do with pretend? Um, well, the thing is, is the one thing that sets us apart from any other species is our capacity to exchange thought through symbols. And in such, um, we exchange concepts. We, we exchange what is, not, not, not simply what is constructively objective, but we also, you know, exchange notions and theories and ideas and thoughts and concepts and metaphysics. Morality in and of itself is a concept, you know. And so being that it's a concept, you can seriously make arguments for whether or not morality even truly exists. Or if it's just this man-made scheme. And in such, I think it's important that uh, we pursue what is moral and what is not. If we're going, to, if we're going to explore morality in earnest, to to define that word is important. Um, to define our concept is important. But there's a quote from Kurt Vonnegut Jr. that's always stuck with me um, from the foreword of his book Mother Night, and it's. Uh, it's a pretty famous quote, and I'm probably going to slaughter it, but it's along the lines of it's very important that you be careful what you pretend to be because you very much are what you pretend to be. And I, I happen to agree with that along the, along the lines of truth and what truth actually is. Like, I also do believe in truth. I, I am, you know, somewhat of a perspectivist and a nihilist, to be sure, but <coughs> since I've agreed... <laughs> to to uh, try to be what my environment describes as sane, I don't get too far into the subjective nature of things and just kind of play the game as it goes along. Concepts are a crazy thing, and when you start getting too far into concepts, you end up going down, uh, down the path of thought and metaphysics that, uh, you know, I mean, they're fun, but at the same time, you immerse yourself in them. It's not very, very helpful, and it's not very... Well, it doesn't increase one's own fitness, <laughs> put it like that. You know, you start thinking too much, and you end up coming to conclusions about, like, Descartes' evil genius, <laughs> uh, and that uh, each individual or the self is simply a head in a jar that's being experimented on, you know, that type of thing. After a point, if you're going to make it along in your environment, you kind of have to take what you see and feel, what your sensory, you know, your sensory input gives you as a granted. And that's where it comes down to pretend, is to what does that sensory input mean for, for the brain? You know what I mean? What does that mean for the self, as it were? And so where it comes down to pretending, and that a person is what they pretend to be, You actually see a lot of that um, in the world around us. Um, our presidents, our, our structures of hierarchy and, and organization, honestly, um, it's a game of ad populum. It really is. We agree to the terms that our society lays out for us, you know, or not. And when we disagree, we end up changing the rules and changing the game. For instance, you know, you take our president, Barack Obama. He's the ruler of America, as it were. But if he were sitting here next to me, he said, you know, go grab me a glass of water. Depending on how much I liked him, I don't know anything about Barack Obama, to be honest. But, I mean, depending on how much I liked him, I could look at him and go, fuck off, get your own glass of water. You know, he doesn't have any authority. He doesn't have any authority over me or you or anybody, really. 
um, except for what we agree he's got authority on, passing bills and whatnot, the executor of the rules. And then, of course, we've, we've got this huge infrastructure worth of hundreds of other people who we agree are suited to make decisions on our behalf. But it takes one individual to say, nah, they're not my boss. They don't tell me what to do to completely fuck that up, you know? So we pretend that Barack Obama is in charge. We play suit. You know, we follow suit with the game that is at hand. We agree to it. And this is all a matter of pretense. We pretend that he's got power, and so he does. You know, he is what we pretend he is. And that works on just about every single level, you know, from the family structure on up, that we pretend that everything and everybody has a certain place within our environment for us to use or not. And if we ever pretend elsewise, then, well, the game either needs to change or we die. Or at least our fitness, fitness level drops, you know. And so it's kind of exploratory in that. And uh, when, it, when it comes to the notion of, of objectivity or objectivity versus subjectivity. It's interesting. I was reading these uh, refutations that Nietzsche had for Descartes' axiom. <laughs> and I honestly, I, I honestly think that Nietzsche did have a point and a purpose that he was trying to depict, but I honestly think that um, his, his uh, dismantling Descartes was merely playing a, a, professional, a game of professionalism. Or it's like, well, we're philosophers, we philosophize. Um, and this is, these are the criteria and the rules to which we're supposed to follow in order to be, you know, considered uh, seriously. Um, so that being the sense that these are the parameters and rules in which we're playing, your axiom is not an axiom, buddy, and here's why. <laughs> you know, and, and he, he semantically picks apart you know, uh, Descartes' axiom, I, I, I think, therefore, I am. You know, the, your first mistake is that you assume I. What is I? What do you mean by I? And then he goes on to say that the uh, subject cannot prove itself. And I agree with that within the parameters of the school of philosophy. But at the same time, when it comes down to the framework for truth, I, I disagree with uh, ardently. Um, my notion is that the subject, or any object, but the subject inherently proves itself. Inherently. It, it proves itself. If you perceive it, it's there. One way or the other. If you want to investigate to which degree it's there, what it means for you that it's there, whatever. You know, but the fact of the matter is, there is that which is there. And I use this, there is a philosophy major I was having a conversation with, but I, I use this to illustrate. Um, my point by my axiom, Kevo's axiom. Three words. These are words. These are words. It's, it's illustrative of, of words. Words inherently prove themselves. These are words. Now, in application to anything else, that's, that's the bitch of it, is the sounds that I'm making to you are simply just words used to depict concept and thought. So in an application of these words to anything else that I might see as true um, has a lot of openings for, for flaws and in, in picking apart. For instance, a tree, you know. Um, <clears throat> a tree is there. If you see the tree, the tree is there. Um, is it a tree? No. We could define tree. We could rework the word tree. We could work around the parameters of what qualifies a tree. And, and as such, we can change the definition of the word tree to where you're no longer looking at a tree. Maybe you're looking at a brick, right? But whatever it is that you're looking at is what you're looking at, and it's there for you to conceptualize about, for you to think about, for you to define. But it's there. It's there, and it's doing what it's doing, and it does what it does, and its purpose is what its purpose is. That brings me back to subjectivity, subjectivity is the... 
you know, what that tree is, what that brick is, whatever it is, may be, is up for me to establish and, 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 and define, right? But those definitions aren't the truth. The, the truth is simply the manifestation of presence. These are words, you know? Um, and I, 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 <laughs> I didn't go in great, uh, great depth about that with this philosophy major, but I said that these are words. And, you know, he immediately starts playing the philosophy game at that point. He's like, well, are they? I disagree. You need to, pr you know, they're not words and you need to prove me wrong. What do you mean by word? And I'm like, I don't have to define word for you. You know what word means. And of course, under the school of philosophy, I do, you know, but at the same time, nothing that he's doing is, is refuting, honestly refuting the illustration of these are words. You know, and I think that's, that's kind of the problem in, in, with, with philosophy is that you know, you, you can't define truth, you know, and, and you can't, <laughs> you can't define it. It can only be observed. You know, truth can only be observed. It can't be defined. It cannot be corralled. It cannot be, you know, manipulated or controlled. What is true simply is what is true, and that's that. And, of course, how the individual values one truth or the other, that's, again, subjective. Metaphysical. You know, uh, you know, he started arguing, you know, and it got down to that head in the jar metaphysical type of sense of things. Like, well, how do you know? How do I even know that you exist? And so, of course, my immediate response was, well, you know, if you're the only thing that exists, that means that I am an extension of you, um, in which case you are now telling yourself that these are words. <laughs> you know, so we play that game for a minute. And anybody who's had a philosophical argument like that before, knows how frustrating it gets and you know, whatever. I just smiled and shook his head and that was that was the day and that was a conversation from that point on. But like I say, I mean, you, you go down too far down the ra rabbit hole of concepts, um, the intellectualization of 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 observation, you do inevitably go down this questioning of your own sanity. The conclusions that drive people like Descartes to postulate there's a possibility that there's an evil genius keeping his head in a jar or brain in a jar. But that does nothing. It's nothing useful for what is actually going on, or at least what is what our sensory um, inputs are giving us. You know, it doesn't change any of that. It doesn't change the sights or the sounds or the thoughts or the notions. It just adds on to, you know what I mean? or put something underneath it. Going, you know, further on along those notions and whatnot. It's it's kind of it's kinda of weird when you start thinking about the game that we play. You know, I I honestly think that, that Nietzsche had a point and a, a purpose behind what he was doing, but that point and that purpose almost certainly will get lost by anybody who simply doesn't get it. You know what I mean? Philosophy has a huge, huge part, and that's the thing. Um, philosophy is, it does play a role. You know what I mean? It's, philosophy is real. You know what I mean? Philosophy, they're, they're, philosophy is a truth in and of itself. But, I mean, I mean, philosophy has contributed to our environment. Philosophy has, has, added on to the quality of our sensory inputs. The practicing of philosophy, the school of philosophy has, but it doesn't define truth. Philosophy is a truth. Replace with dictate, please. Thinking and the doing. I'm more thinking than doing a good portion of the time. Doing I'm not too good at. All concepts, no truth. The individual very much is what they do. They are 
the character they're putting their costumes on for. The president is, is the president. The police officer is a police officer. But if one random person were to throw on a cop's uniform and pretend to be a cop, their amount of success in being a cop is contingent upon how many other people agree with that, how many people buy into it. Like Ayn Rand, you know, self-proclaimed philosopher, and that's the bitch of it, is that uh, I think in her own right she should be regarded as such, but it scares me that she is, you know, because she didn't actually have a constructed philosophical or etymological, etymological framework for which her philosophy was laid down. No, she was just a very popular author who gained enough popularity to where people can agree that today she's a philosopher, and hence she is. That's the bitch of it. So many years after her death, people are still arguing as to whether or not she's a philosopher, and I would wager that 250 years from now, She's going to be, you know, depicted, at least in, in a footnote somewhere, of some historical text as a philosopher with a philosophy. <laughs> and as much as any philosopher today would pick that apart and say nay, she very much became what she most pretended to be. The thing is, philosophy is all concept. You know, philosophy is all thought. And... There's no established truth that can be established merely in the defining of things. But philosophy does get applied into how we conceptualize. And thus, it does have a relevant place in reality. It does have a relevant place as a truth. So does religion, for that matter. And it's the same same grounds as God being real. You know, um, whether or not there's actually a bearded man in the clouds, no, you can refute that. But God is real as a concept in the sense that people believe it. And God has manifest as a concept within our culture and within our reality. And in that sense, God is real. And I think there's a number of people who actually realize that, that God is real only in the sense of a concept, and they embrace that one way or the other, for ill or for bad. You know, a lot of people take God as kind of this tool to manipulate, to acquisition power and manipulation, and they do. But a lot of other people use God as this excuse to be charitable, to enhance their own subjective view of morality, and to increase what they view as love. Some, some really positive shit comes from that, too. And so it can be said that God is, and God is real, and God is both an insane prick and the all-loving concept that we often describe it as being. God is a meme, and memes are real. <laughs> but only in so much that we've described it, you know. <coughs> Uh, so we've got this little game going on between concrete material reality, objectified truth, and then concept, the imaginary games that we all play. And that's the bitch of it. Those, those games are the manifest truth, the truth of things. You know what I mean? Barack Obama wears a shirt. <laughs> Does he, though? Who is Barack Obama? Is Barack Obama just a name? How many people are Barack Obama? How many people can wear the name Barack Obama and call themselves president? Well, really, only the one. At least, only the one that can be taken by the masses as, seriously, the president who wears a shirt. So it's not to say that, you know, everything we do is pretend. 
Well, I guess, uh, you know, all of our concepts and words are, are not rule, you know, are not real. Really, all we have to do is, human, as human beings, is just to multiply and die. Self-replicate and die. Self-replicate and die. So, we're just hang the sense of any of it. If you choose to, whatever. Go out into the middle of the woods, forget everything, and try to survive. Best of luck to you. Philosophy doesn't do shit. Yeah, well, it doesn't, it doesn't. It affects reality, but it isn't reality. It's not depictive reality. It just adds on to what we do, and what we do is what's real.